is The National. The growing storm over more Trump tweets. He alleges Barack Obama had him wiretapped. There was no such wiretap activity mounted. But now the White House wants Congress to investigate. Plus, Trump and his ties to Russia. As the allegations face fresh scrutiny, how serious are they? Transgender activists square off against the BC preacher who objects to parts of an anti-discrimination law. And I had to pay an insane amount of money. The cell phone fee that has providers raking in millions and customers crying foul. For the Trump administration this week, the glow of good news didn't last, overshadowed again by alleged Russia links. But when the going gets tough, Trump gets tweeting. Today, he doubled down on those accusations. Barack Obama personally ordered wiretaps of his offices. And again, he showed no evidence. Paul Hunter has the latest. If you look through the bushes, there he is, Donald Trump, golfing this weekend in Florida, while the rest of America tried to make sense, any sense at all, of his latest tweets. His allegation, citing no evidence, that somehow Barack Obama ordered Trump Tower to be wiretapped just before the November election. An allegation today roundly rejected by those who ought to know. FBI Director James Comey reportedly labeled it flat out false, said the former head of the U.S. National Intelligence Service. There was no such wiretap activity mounted against uh, the president, uh, the president-elect at the time or as a candidate or against his campaign. And yet Trump tweeted it. Terrible, he wrote. A new low. This is Nixon Watergate. Many were quick to point out a key problem for Trump. Either he's recklessly misleading the country or Obama did seek a wiretap, but to do that would require evidence of a serious crime at Trump Tower. As Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer put it today... But either way, there's trouble. So why would he do such a thing? Say Democrats, simple. It's a diversion. You make up something and then you have the press write about it and then you say everybody's writing about this charge. It's a tool of an authoritarian to just have you always be talking about what you want them to be talking about. Goes the thinking, if the story is Obama, there are fewer headlines on, for example, Trump's alleged ties with Russia. Anything to change the subject for where the, from where the heat is. I, I agree. Why is the president But the White House is having none of it, look, choosing I mean, today to downplay naysayers and logic, believe, instead uh, emphasizing what if potential. it's true. If it is, this is the greatest overreach and the greatest abuse of power that I think we've ever seen in a huge attack on democracy itself. And the American people have a right to know if this took place. The White House went even further on this today, calling on Congress as it investigates Russian meddling in the election to now include Obama in that inquiry, adding that neither the White House nor the president will comment until the investigation wraps up. In other words, anyone's free to ask, why'd you tweet that? But Trump won't answer. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. There may be more controversy on the horizon. Reports citing senior U.S. government officials say the White House will unveil a new version of its travel ban tomorrow. It's unclear how the new version will differ from the original executive order, a temporary ban on immigration from seven Muslim-majority countries. After causing chaos at airports and sparking protest, it was suspended by U.S. judges last month. In France, center-right presidential candidate François Fillon struck a defiant tone at a big rally today. Dans un ultime effort, vive la France, vive la République. Once expected to win, Fillon's campaign has been damaged by allegations he paid his wife for political work that was never done. Fillon's fellow Republican and former Prime Minister Alain Juppé has called a press conference for tomorrow, leading to speculation he could try to replace Fillon on the ticket. The scandal has provided a boost to far-right candidate Marine Le Pen, who has a slight lead in the polls. French elections start April 23rd. The Prime Minister of the Netherlands was also working the crowds today, with elections in that country just a week and a half away. 
Mark Ruta is neck and neck in the polls with far-right leader Hirt Wilders and his ultra-conservative Freedom Party. Wilders has proposed banning Muslim immigration, closing mosques, and pulling the Netherlands out of the EU. Street by street, house by war-torn house, ISIS control of the Iraqi city of Mosul is slowly cratering. And according to doctors and rights groups, ISIS fighters are turning to increasingly brutal tactics. Now, soldier and civilian alike face not just snipers and suicide bombs, but chemical weapons too. Rebecca Collard has the story. Yasser Hamid is one of the victims of the latest atrocity against civilians in Iraq. Four days ago, his home was hit by a suspected chemical weapons attack. His 10-year-old brother, Thaer, recalled what happened. My brother was inside the house and I was on the rooftop and my sister was on the staircase, he says. We heard a bang in the street and then something hit the house. Then it collapsed. According to the United Nations, 12 people are now being treated for chemical exposure. Some in this hospital in Erbil, 100 kilometers from Mosul. The International Committee of the Red Cross is treating the victims. Uh, we're not aware yet what chemicals were actually used, but this has been investigated further. At the moment, we're just treating them according to their, their complaints. Staff here are now being trained to deal with future possible chemical attacks. As doctors and nurses treat these victims, thousands of more civilians are pouring out of Mosul, escaping the offensive on the western part of the city. Estimates say as many as 800,000 civilians could still be inside. And on the front lines, signs of an exodus. Covered in mud, families walk for hours to escape. It's very dangerous, muddy and crowded. Some people lost their children, says Umm Ibrahim. We left our houses and everything behind. We fled only with the clothes on our back. They are joining the 200,000 civilians already displaced since the start of the Mosul offensive in October. Humanitarian organizations are warning there is not the space to shelter nor the supplies to care for the hundreds of thousands of civilians that may escape in the coming weeks and months. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Erbil, Northern Iraq. Coming up, a Sunday talk on Donald Trump's Russia headache. Not since the Cold War has there been so much potential for fallout. And later, the man with a plan for the Democratic Party. We want change, 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 change. Yes, on all fronts. Why, you'll want to hear what former Bernie Sanders advisor Larry Cohen has to say. Hundreds of asylum seekers have crossed into Canada this year. And while some people are arguing for tighter border controls, others are reaching out to help. Emily Brass has the story. Things are changing in Hemingford, a tiny town where a growing number of asylum seekers are entering Canada. Some at a town hall meeting today live on Roxham Road, where many cross the border on foot. It was a very quiet little dead-end lane, and now we have equipment up there, we have <laughs> RCMP, 12-hour shifts, but we don't see the people. That's because they're immediately arrested and taken to border services. The RCMP says the main concern is keeping people safe. I guess it was minus 18, minus 19 with the wind. So uh, it's an issue for us because our fear is to find a family or someone who's frozen to death. Today, he and other experts answered questions about the asylum process. The majority of Hemingford residents who are here today say they weren't worried about people crossing the border. Rather, they're trying to find out how they could help. One young mother asked whether she's allowed to invite asylum seekers into her home. People of young families are crossing over and they have no clothes and very little food. And, and uh, yeah, so we were wondering if legally we could greet them. I mean, pick them up in, in our car and bring them over to our house and feed them, give them a warm meal and maybe give them a chance to shower. It turns out they can. But officials say the Red Cross is already at the border to meet these basic needs. From there, asylum seekers are taken to shelters and get help filing claims. The UN has been monitoring activity at the border. There's really nothing to 
panic about because it's well managed uh, by the government and the uh, civil society is taking uh, their own uh, responsibilities. The number of people making refugee claims at unofficial border points climbed to more than 2,200 between January 1st and February 21st, up nearly 500 from the same period last year. Federal, provincial and municipal officials are looking into what changes might be necessary. They don't expect numbers to rise dramatically as the weather gets warmer. Emily Brass, CBC News, Hemingford. Canadians already pay some of the highest cell phone rates in the world, something we've collectively grumbled about for years. Well, here's some news that might darken your view on the topic. The big mobile providers are raking in tons of extra money for a service many feel should be free. Natalie Collada explains. It's a fee that makes telecoms tens of millions of dollars and has some customers seeing red. I had to pay an insane amount of money to get it put onto my own phone network. I had to pay for the factory a mock and then plus the SIM, plus the plan. The common practice is providers will order their phones straight from the manufacturers locked. That way, the phones can only work with their service. But if a customer wants to change the provider and unlock the phone, typically they have to pay a hefty fee, as much as $50. Last year, more than 900,000 phones were unlocked by service providers in Canada, making companies roughly $37 million. In the last few years, that's gone up several millions of dollars, with more people asking to unlock their phones. At a CRTC hearing last month, providers like Bell, Rogers and Telus stood by the unlocking charges. They say popular phones are targets for resale overseas and the fees deter it. In the instance of these very hot, iconic devices, you know, we want them to stay in the country in which they were intended for. The companies also said the fees protect them from customers walking away from their contracts, with consumers forced to wait 90 days to have their phones unlocked. The unlocking fee, uh, we believe, helps uh, further deter those incidences of fraud. Customers don't like it. Well, they think it's a ripoff. Consumer advocate Dennis Hogarth believes unlocking fees are a way to prevent customers from straying. It's really, I think, an effort, more of an effort to make sure that uh, people are tied in to a single wireless service provider. Nobody knows whether the current unlocking fees are a reasonable charge or if they're uh, set at a rate that makes it difficult for uh, people to leave the ne their networks. Not all providers are in favor of the fee. Upstart Freedom Mobile, formerly known as Win, wants to get rid of it. Meanwhile, the CRTC is currently reviewing Canada's wireless code and the unlocking fee. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. BC officials are warning of significant avalanche risks after two incidents in the backcountry this weekend. One man was killed near Whistler. Two others had to be rescued from a mountain in West Vancouver. His head was six feet down. A pair of skiers were caught in an avalanche in Cypress Provincial Park. One was swept off a cliff and buried under two meters of snow for several minutes. He was dug out and taken to hospital with serious injuries. Further north off Vancouver Island, emergency crews are responding to a diesel spill near Echo Bay. At least 1,500 litres leaked into the water at a salmon farm. The company that owns the site says most of the spill is confined to the fish pens, but slicks could also be seen nearby. And there was a dramatic rescue in stormy waters off Newfoundland this morning. Search and rescue personnel were dispatched after receiving a distress call from a fishing boat. Five people were airlifted to safety. A BC pastor already under fire for his views on transgender rights is back on the hot seat. Paul Dirk says he bears transgender people no ill will, but he unleashed a firestorm with his campaign to block a bill that would expand protections. Today, protesters brought a message to his doorstep. Deborah Goebel has more. If things had gone as Pastor Paul Dirks had planned, the protesters would have come over to his side of the street. Instead, he walks over to theirs. I'm certainly not comfortable with this. We're here to dissent, and let's make that the center of what's going on. It was members of the transgender community and their supporters that organized this protest across the street from the church. 
because more than a month ago, Pastor Dirks launched a campaign opposing parts of Bill C-16, a bill that amends the Human Rights Act, making it illegal to discriminate against gender identity and expression. The pastor and others say they have no issue with things like housing and employment equity, but they do object to transgender people having the right to choose when it comes to showers, locker rooms, rape shelters or camp cabins. Their fear is sexual predators will take advantage. So when you decide, I'm going to like make a safe space based on what people look like instead of the behavior and the content of their character, then that is exactly what it means to violate someone's human rights. If my wife needs to use the bathroom right now, which one does she use, the boys or the girls? My wife is standing right in front of me. Uh, I, I think that, that there is, that there should be, um, that there should be third spaces. I think there are girls that say that, that it makes a difference if, there, if, if there's male genitalia in, when they're vulnerable and naked. There are already laws to protect women against rape and assault. There are no laws to protect the human rights of trans people. Exactly. That's the issue. I'm willing to have dialogue with, uh, with people that are coming at this from a different point of view. But has it changed um, your mind about, about your Bill position? C 16? About Bill C-16? No. No. For more than an hour, the pastor and the protesters talked, but in the end, nothing really changed. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, New Westminster. Borders and refugees are just a few of the challenging issues up for discussion lately, as MPs return to Parliament this week. With a look ahead at what Canadians can expect, here's Alison Crawford from our Ottawa Bureau. Well, two big border issues are up for debate. One is a bill to expand U.S. Customs preclearance at some Canadian airports and train stations while also giving American officials more powers to question and detain people on Canadian soil. The second is continued pressure from the NDP for the government to suspend the safe third country agreement with the United States. It requires people to claim refugee status in the first safe country they land in, which for all of these people crossing our border is the United States. The NDP argues the United States is no longer a safe country for refugees. They say by allowing asylum seekers to make claims at regular border crossings, people will stop making that dangerous nighttime dash across the border. Another bill of interest to many Canadians is one to ban genetic discrimination by preventing insurance companies and employers from getting the results of people's tests for genetic diseases or conditions. Many Canadians are opting out of these tests for themselves and their kids because they fear the results could make them ineligible for private health care insurance in the future. The government has introduced a motion that would, according to the bill's sponsor, Liberal MP Rob Oliphant, gut the bill. And that's because the Justice Department says the bill is unconstitutional. Why? because provinces regulate the insurance industry. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. The Trump administration continues to be bogged down by questions about potential ties to Russia. How bad could this get for the president? The Sunday Talk is next.
time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. This week, what's going on between the Trump administration and Russia? Trump's people say it's all just a witch hunt, false news. But if they're wrong, how big of a scandal is this? To answer that, we brought on some experts this week. But first, some background. I would have a very, very good relationship with Putin, and I think I would have a very, very good relationship with Russia. Just what mischief uh, is Russia up to in connection with our election? First, the Democratic National Committee's emails were hacked and leaked to the press. Intelligence agencies said Russia did it, trying to tip the election in Trump's favor. My God, we're Americans. This is a foreign government got involved in our election. That's like Russia attacked us. Then came that dossier from a former British spy that, if authentic, suggests Russian intelligence actively cultivated Trump. It was a group of opponents that got together, sick people, and they put that crap together. Then President Obama imposed new sanctions on Russia. That same day, Trump's incoming national security advisor, Michael Flynn, called the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak, later telling the White House... They did not discuss anything having to do with the United States' decision to impose a censure against Russia. Turns out Flynn did talk sanctions and had to step down for misleading the White House. General Flynn's resignation is not the end of the story. It is merely the beginning. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give... Now, Trump's new attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is accused of lying under oath. I didn't have, not have communications with the Russians. But the Washington Post reports Sessions did meet with Ambassador Kislyak during the campaign, twice. The most senior justice official has now recused himself from investigations into Russian meddling. And the latest? The New York Times reports that the man who is perhaps Trump's closest advisor of all, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, met with the Russian ambassador as well. I'm joined now by our guests for some American perspective on all of this. Sasha Eisenberg is an author and political journalist. He's in Los Angeles. And Louisa Savage is an editorial director at Political Live. She's in Washington tonight. So just trying to get a sense, we can talk about the latest curveball, Sasha, in just a sec, which, of course, is uh, President Trump accusing President Obama of wiretapping uh, him during the election campaign. But first, let's talk about the, the, the Russian so-called scandal. Is it a scandal? How big a scandal is it, do you think? Does it compare to something like Watergate, for example? It's, it's unquestionably a scandal, I think, if you have the national security advisor uh, quit. Um, uh, with the acknowledgement that he lied both to the American public and to uh, his own colleagues, including the vice president. I think that rises to the level of a scandal. And the number of people who now have been touched, both on the Trump campaign, the transition, and in the White House, by uh, all these questions about the Russian contacts um, makes it pretty broad. Now, the, the real difference between this and Watergate, we don't know where this will end, um, but that it's so happening so early in the Trump presidency is really remarkable. I mean, the, the big scandals that we think of in modern American politics, Watergate, Iran-Contra, uh, the, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, they all happened in the second term of a presidency. That meant basically that, you know, Nixon, Reagan, Clinton had a term fairly unmolested by these major distractions to advance their agenda. Um, uh, what's happening now I think risks just weeks into the Trump presidency entirely dominating uh, the attention of members of Congress, the press, uh, distracting his own White House, um, depleting whatever uh, goodwill there was in Washington to to uh, uh, help him govern. And and you know we risk having a presidency for however many years that uh, happens almost entirely in the shadow of this scandal. That's remarkable. How remarkable do you think it is, uh, Louisa? Lots of headlines, uh, lots of smoke. What do you think? Well, I think we don't know yet. I think the comparison to Watergate falters a little bit because in Watergate you had a, a president that ordered uh, wiretapping and break-ins to his political opponents, and we don't know what Donald Trump's role was in the hacking of the Democratic uh, Committee's emails and the Clinton campaign's emails by um, agents of Russia. We do know that, as you pointed out in your setup, that the National Security Advisor was discussing sanctions with the Russian ambassador, and that's why he had to step down. Now Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, is recusing himself from any investigations dealing with the Russians because he had two meetings, as you pointed out, with the uh, Russian ambassador. But officials 
meet with and senators meet with ambassadors all the time. We don't know what they talked about, whether it was at all, um, you know, nefarious or, or, or illegal or reason for concern. It, it, maybe it wasn't. We don't know the answers to that. And I think there's a lot here to be investigated. And I think there are a ton of questions, both uh, among Democrats and Republicans. So, Sasha, I mean, it is a, a diplomat's job to speak to the powerful, uh, a senator's job to speak to the diplomats. Why do you suspect there's something else going on here? What, what is it that you're most worried about? Is it Trump's motivations or Putin's? Everything we've talked about, uh, there, there's no evidence that we know yet that any of it is, is on its face illegal. And a lot of it is, as Louisa points out, has uh, sort of innocuous explanations. Yes, government officials talk to diplomats. The things they talk about have to do with government policy. Um, that's not unusual. Um, what it is becoming remarkable, uh, what seem to be the lengths that a lot of different people in the Trump organization have gone to to lie both to their own colleagues and to the public. And now, as we learn in the case of, of Jeff Sessions, to a Senate committee under oath um, about these meetings, which if, if all these folks thought that they were innocuous routine meetings, um, it, it seems like we're, we're seeing a whole lot of efforts to, to distract or or cover them up. Um, I, I think that's what makes people think that, you know, that th this can't just be a series of, conve of, of you know, um, coincidences that, that all these people in Trump world had different parallel interactions with, with, uh, uh, with Russian entities that now they're so sheepish about that they're, they're even lying to their own colleagues and that the administration doesn't really have the ability to tell a coherent story about about why all this was happening. I think that, that, that's what's animating uh, a real fear that, that, um, that there is something there, whether it includes the president himself, we, we don't know. Um, but what, you know, the way that these um, stories seem to get their momentum is that there are enough questions that force politicians to uh, empower investigative bodies, whether in Congress or through the executive branch. And then people get subpoena power, the ability to summon witnesses, to demand documents. And those things often lead in all sorts of places that, that people didn't anticipate. Right. And I would add to that, one of the reasons people are so concerned is uh, President Trump has been very, um, he hasn't wanted to condemn the hacking, right? At first he said, well, maybe it was the Russians, maybe it was China. We don't know. Whereas the intelligence agencies were saying, yes, it was Russia. Um, he, he wouldn't condemn them. He openly said, hey, Russia, if you're hacking, um, you know, go after Hillary Clinton and, and, and so forth. He called on them to do it. Um, and beyond that, he's called for a reset of relations with Russia. And his campaign um, was involved in pushing to change the language in the Republican National Committee's platform on dealing with Ukraine. The, the Republicans wanted to put in language they're calling for arming of anti-Russian uh, Ukrainian forces. And there were reports that the Republican, um, that the Trump campaign was against that and were actively pushing to keep that language out, um, which was a position much more favorable to Russia. So it, it's not just that, that there were meetings, but there was, he was very open about taking a different policy approach. Now, he says that's common sense, that, that Russia and the United States have a common enemy in ISIS and in terrorism, and that they should, um, you know, change their relationship. But it does add to this this broader picture of of why w were the Russians um, helping him over Hillary Clinton? We just got a couple of minutes left, but I do want to touch on the the curveball that happened this weekend, Sasha, which was President Trump accusing President Obama of ordering a wiretap uh, on him at Trump Tower uh, or of Trump Tower during the election campaign. What do you think of that? So we don't know what the underlying truth of that allegation is. If if uh, a wiretap was authorized, um, uh, you know, one of two things happened. Uh, either as uh, President Trump alleges, it was uh, basically uh, a political effort by, by the Obama White House. That's an incredibly um, uh, provocative allegation for one president to lodge at his predecessor. Um, if it was not done for political convenience by the Obama White House, that is to say, if a wiretap were, were authorized through the uh, uh, traditional legal channels, then um, that would suggest that a court uh, saw um, evidence that Trump was either uh, engaged in criminal activity or was an agent of a foreign government, um, which would be uh, a pretty remarkable thing to, to have confirmed that, that evidence is floating around in front of a, uh, one of our foreign uh, uh, intelligence surveillance courts. 
Um, the other possibility, as has been the case with a lot of things that Trump has thrown out, either uh, from his own mouth or on Twitter, is that it is uh, rumor mongering, that it's his own conspiracy theorizing. This has been bubbling up in sort of right wing media in the U.S. this week, this allegation that, that the Obama White House was trying to sort of actively uh, and illegally undermine Trump starting through the campaign. Um, in that case, we once again have a, a president, as he did with allegations of voter fraud and a whole lot of other things, um, who, who's throwing out really remarkable uh, charges without any evidence to back them. And we saw the, the, the you know, Trump White House today try to sort of throw this on Congress's lap, telling them to investigate uh, and saying that they won't talk about it any further, which I suspect is not an answer that um, uh, the media will, will uh uh, take as a, an instruction really to be quiet or that Congress will be too happy about. Louisa, how did you read it and what do you be watching for now? I think it's false. Uh, the President Obama's spokesman has come out and said this is absolutely flatly untrue. Uh, the former director of national intelligence has come out and said there was no uh, wiretapping of Donald Trump or his campaign. Um, now, the director of the FBI came out today, the New York Times has reported, and said this is untrue, and he's called on the Department of Justice to clarify and state for the record that this did not happen, and the Just Justice Department, which is, of course, part of the Trump administration, has not done so. Um, you have um, Sessions, who's recused himself, and, and now who, who under him can come out and, and say that this didn't happen. So I think you're going to see tremendous pushback against this extraordinary accusation that, that Donald Trump has, has said against um, President Obama. I think it's more likely that there was some kind of surveillance, perhaps, of a server in Trump Tower or perhaps of other people around Donald Trump as part of the investigation into what's been going on with, with Russia and, and hacking of the elections. But it's, it seems, based on all the comments that have come out today it seems incredibly unlikely that, that there's any truth to this allegation. Well, only a few weeks into this administration, a few more stories to watch. Thanks so much for uh, being part of this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Well, it isn't just the Trump administration that seems to be in a bit of disarray. So is the Democratic Party. And when we come back, you'll meet the man who thinks the right way to shake it up is by going left. Some people have compared your movement to a Tea Party of the left. Uh-huh. Is Larry Cohen setting up the next round for Bernie Sanders? The Sunday interview is next.
since the election victory of Donald Trump, the gap between Democrats and Republicans is widening. But an interesting parallel is also emerging, and the anti-establishment grassroots movement within the Democratic Party, led by the team behind Bernie Sanders' presidential run. Larry Cohen is heading that movement. Our conversation from Washington in just a moment. But first, let's set the scene. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. Washington is a deeply divided place these days. Everything that is broken in our country can be fixed. But standing up to Donald Trump isn't the only battle in American politics. The Democratic Party is working through some serious identity issues. The American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. Thank you. Me too. Bernie Sanders lost his party's nomination to Hillary Clinton, but he became a political sensation. Thank you all very much. And now his team is mobilizing to replace the Democratic establishment. The powers of the president shall not be questioned. Sanders supporters are packing town hall meetings and taking on Democrat incumbents. This feels like the most dangerous time we've been in for decades creating a sort of tea party of the left, challenging not just Trump, but their own party. Who is our person going to be? One of the leaders is Larry Cohen. He's a former union president and advisor to Sanders during his run for the White House. Now, he's part of an organization called Our Revolution that is working to shake up the Democratic Party. I sat down with Larry Cohen recently in Washington. Larry Cohen, nice to meet you. Yeah, great to be with you. So you want politics to change. You want the Democratic Party to change, too. We, we want change, 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 yes, on all fronts. Not just resistance to Trump, but real change, grassroots change, people involved in, an, in a sustainable way, not just in the moment. So last weekend, there was a contest between yeah. the establishment <laughs> Democrats and the Bernie Sanders Democrats, I suppose. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present the next chair of the Democratic National Committee, Mr. Tom Perez. So your candidate, Keith Ellison, yeah. he didn't win. Right. But now there seems to be this new arrangement. The, the, the guy who won, Tom Perez, is saying yeah. he's, my, he's my deputy. To appoint Keith Ellison deputy chair of the Democratic National Committee. So is everything just hunky-dory now? Well, I mean, we have to, this is about the grassroots and the state level. There's a lot of work to do. Um, Tom is a great guy. I knew him pretty well as labor secretary. Um, have to define what his deputy mean. Um, that's so not you defined. want him to have a real voice? Yeah, a real voice. Imagine that. Yes, a real voice, not just uh, something symbolic. So it was pretty bad blood between Hillary Clinton and Bernie S Sanders by the end of the campaign. So, like, where, where are you now? It sounds like... It sounds yeah, like well, you... Bernie then threw himself into the Hillary Clinton campaign, to be fair. I mean, he knocked himself out in the way that only Bernie can, you know, almost as many road trips as she had, and was pretty sincere about anything to support her and defeat Trump. Um, as did Keith Ellison. So Keith Ellison had campaigned for Bernie and switched even before the convention, right before. But are, do you want a Bernie Sanders takeover of the Democratic Party? No, not a Bernie Sanders takeover, but uh, uh, yes, I want um, a Democratic Party that's populist. I'm not afraid of that word. That is a little bit messy in the sense that real people, everyday people, feel like it's theirs. And it not wasn't? that it belongs to the elite. Wasn't before? Uh, it probably never was exactly that. So did Democrats he, blow it? Blow it in what? The, when? the the election? Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to remember, in any other democracy, Hillary Clinton would be the president. She won. She got sixty-eight and a half million votes. She won by almost three million. You know, we we have uh, <laughs> an early democracy, is what I call it, with this electoral college system and with rural counting much more than urban. And you know, so to be fair, she won in any other country. But this is the only one that matters when you live here. And so, you know, in a certain sense, that would probably be fair to say that. Uh, you know, we should have been able to win that election, which means we had to win the election in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And that means uh, we have to be clear about working people, whether they're black, brown, or white, uh, about the kind of issues people face every day, what kind of jobs they can get, uh, how they participate uh, at work, what kind of rights they have, what kind of rights they have in the democracy itself, what kind of health care we have, what happens to their kids, what happens to their parents, all the things that people care about everywhere else in the world. We have to be very focused on those kinds of things. So how far do you want to take this? How much change 
do you want? Are you going to run candidates against incumbent Democrats? Our revolution may well do that, yeah, in many cases. Um, in more cases, we will encourage regular folks get involved at the same time everybody else does. Because, I mean, there's but gigantic won't that split opportunity. the party? Is that no, that's what democracy is. You get involved. You, I mean, the main thing we would do is get people involved, you know, run for school board, run for the city council, uh, you know, run against Republicans. But, yeah, at times, that democracy means you run to change uh, the party, too. So toss out some of the establishment yeah. Democrats? Yeah, at times, yes. Absolutely. Some people have compared your movement to a Tea Party of the left. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that there's some similarity there in the sense that you know, we, this is politics of conviction, of values that's issue-based, that's focused on change. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, none of the values are the same, right? I don't think there's too many values that we would share with them. But, but I think the approach that, um, that, that we need to take politics seriously, that it affects everyday life and that, that, and that all of us um, can get involved, you know, it's probably a similarity. The Tea Party of the right, the original one, <laughs> um, kind of tore the Republicans apart. You're prepared to face that in your party? No, we're building. So we're getting ma millions Does of people everyone involved. Think that? Well, they may, but I'm just, that, no, honestly, if we took Washington State as an example, we got people involved at the precinct level, who, which in chunks of Washington State were vacant positions, precinct captains. Um, then they got involved in the county level and they worked their way up. And, you know, the involvement is way higher. California, uh, we got tens of thousands of people to vote at the party level, at the grassroots party level that had never voted before. I mean, that's how you get people not only involved in the party, but then involved in the electoral process and also involved in this resistance. Uh, you know, we're fighting back. Some people argue that Donald Trump, during his campaign, spoke to those people, that there was a similarity yeah. between Sanders and Trump. Yeah, I think similarity of words, not deeds. I grew up in a house with my great-grandmother, and she said, I'll watch your feet, not your mouth. So I think the words of Donald Trump sometimes say that, but he has a cabinet of billionaires that we're resisting as well. He doesn't have everyday folks that he's tried to speak to in the campaign. So I think that there's a big gap there. But Will you go after some of the people that's, that supported him? I mean, are they winnable at this absolutely, point? Absolutely, yeah. Let's not even go after them. We'll encourage them to get involved, run for office. Um, you know, we're in this together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you go deep into some of those counties and those industrial states, you see people that, you know, should be voting with other working people instead of voting for the billionaire. And it makes no sense. So, yes, we, we will collaborate with those people in, in many ways. But we will do it in a frame of, of racial justice, of uh, social justice, of environmental justice. We have to learn how we collaborate together. Trump has made a big issue out of uh, how he treats migrants, uh, the immigration, travel. How do you approach that issue? And we why, were at the airports. We, we encouraged people <laughs> to be at the airports. That was, you know, we were one of the major groups that did that. We'll stay not only at the airports, in the streets. We will fight that. The, you know, tolerance is the beginning for any society, um, not pitting people against each other. We will, our revolution has a whole sanctuary program that starts with a congregation or a campus and goes all the way up to a state and states where that's possible, like California. Uh, we're not turning back from any of that. So Trump... Lots of people have said, just stand back, let him do his thing. He won. Um, you're not. No, no, we don't stand back. We stand up. <laughs> but are you making any ground? The guy just won an election. Is it, sure. Did, does his appeal still apply, or is it starting Yeah, to... but I mean, it's a grassroots thing. We've got to go into Indianapolis. We've got to go into, uh, you know, Macomb County, Michigan, outside of Detroit, right near the Windsor. We've got to go into those communities where we live and talk about the things that are unite us. And, uh, and build campaigns around those issues. And, you know, I've always done that, not stopping now. Thanks so much for this. Thank you, Wendy. And we've got a bit more about Bernie Sanders coming up. Tonight's Look Back remembers his first big political splash. But next, China's governing class descends on Beijing with plenty of intrigue packed in their luggage. In the laboratory, film shot during the morning is now being processed. Several miles of film pass through these machines every week.
A final conference with the producer, the assignment editor, and the man who physically puts the program together, the lineup editor. They discuss items that are available, items that failed, and stories they hope will still be realized before airtime. Bandits in Montreal. We have a funny bit by O'Brien from St. John. Pressure also begins to build on the film editors who are called upon to handle several types of film and sound systems. This particular one is known as double system, where the film image is on one strip of 16 millimeter film and the sound is on a separate strip of recording tape of the same width. The two must be kept in perfect synchronization at all times, a task which demands intense concentration. Color film, above all, requires special care and is always handled with soft cotton gloves. The slightest speck of dirt can cause a scratch visible along the length of the film. The film you see here is being edited for this particular program. In addition to all his other duties, the lineup editor has to screen each film as it arrives, evaluate it, and decide on its edited length. Yeah. Seems to be good. A simpler film editing process and slightly faster to handle is single system, with the soundtrack already recorded on a narrow strip of tape along one edge. Although less versatile for editing purposes, it is more easily handled, and at this moment in the day, every minute counts. Brendan, what time do you expect O'Brien's film? The lineup editor's title explains his job. He literally lines up the film and decides in which order the various films will run during the newscast. Naturally, this list is subject to frequent change as a developing story assumes greater importance or another item fails to materialize. His biggest problems are time and people. People who arrive late, people who arrive early, people who don't arrive at all. China's political players are gathered in Beijing today for the National People's Congress. Top lawmakers from across the country will weigh policy and take stock of who's rising and who's falling out of favor with China's increasingly powerful leader. Sasha Petrusik was there. This annual meeting of the National People's Congress, China's parliament, is really just a precursor to a bigger and much more significant meeting of the Chinese Communist Party this fall. And while significant issues will be discussed here, including the economy and pollution, some of the more controversial ones have been scrubbed from the agenda. No one wants disagreements to be breaking out here. As delegates gather from across China, dressed in traditional gowns, suits, or uniforms, there are wish lists for new rail lines or lower taxes. But the real talk is about power at the top. Everyone's watching President Xi Jinping as he lays the foundation for major political moves this fall. He's already started to put allies in key government positions, and he's trying to prevent other ones from being forced into retirement at the traditional age of 68. There's even word he may want to replace Prime Minister Li Keqiang, who opened the Congress this morning with vows to protect China's sovereignty, saying neither Hong Kong nor Taiwan have an independent future. Li Keqiang is not one of Xi's men. He's of a younger, somewhat more liberal generation. And if Xi wants him sidelined, it's so that he can stay in power longer. Xi's been at the top for five years, and normally, Chinese leaders prepare to move on about now, grooming successors among this crowd to take over after 10 years. He would announce that at this fall's big party congress, but word here is he may not. 
In any case, at this meeting, policies will be discussed, but it's really power that's on everybody's mind. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Beijing. Stay with us now. Still ahead, the Sunday look back. Tonight, it's the evolution of Bernie Sanders. He won his first election by just 10 votes, a genuine upset. From socialist mayor to political sensation, that's next on The National. After our chat with former Bernie Sanders advisor Larry Cohen, we wanted to look back at the roots of Sanders' political career. Here's part of a CBC story from nearly 30 years ago. 
Okay, just wanted to say goodbye. Thanks for all your... Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Let me tell you, I really have... Nobody ever called him Mr. Mayor. He was always just plain Bernie. Rumpled, rude, and charming at the same time. Good work. The socialist from Brooklyn who turned conservative Burlington upside down. To me, what socialism means is democracy means doing away with a system where 1% of the population owns half of the wealth, where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. He won his first election by just 10 votes, a genuine upset. An independent beating both the Democrats and the Republicans. Burlington soon became the only city in America with its own foreign policy. His followers soon became known as Sanderistas, and he became not just a socialist mayor, but a celebrity. I mean, the city has certainly prospered under his reign. Bernie the mayor never did win many friends among the city's business leaders. After all, these were the people he liked to attack the most, the so-called ruling class. We deal with statistics and try to analyze its impact, and everybody snores and goes to sleep. Bernie comes out, it's we, they, it's the rich against the poor, and bam, that's it. And people understand that. Thanks to talk to you. Thank you. Last year, he ran for a seat in the U.S. Congress, again as an independent, and came very close to winning. But for now, he's leaving Burlington City Hall, leaving politics, perhaps to teach or write, but most Sanderistas think he won't be out of politics for long. And I thank all of you very much for your support and for allowing me the opportunity to serve. Thank you very much. Almost three decades after winning hearts at the Calgary Winter Olympics, Eddie the Eagle Edwards returned to soar again today. <laughs> The British ski jumper is now 53, but he's still pretty spry. Eddie finished dead last in the standings back in 88, but his never-say-die attitude made him a fan favorite. Today's promotional event brought out a huge crowd to see Eddie fly once again. Now, just before we go, take a look at a story we'll have for you in the coming days. I'm Nala Ayed in Tehran. What are Canadians doing in Iran's oil and gas fields? They could be doing a lot more if it weren't for the delicate diplomatic obstacles. I'll have that story for you this week on The National. And that's The National for this Sunday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.